So, you know, we've got otherwise good doctors entering in these situations with people in acute withdrawal and they don't know how to handle it. They're doing, they're doing whatever they can to get rid of us in, you know, even in un underhanded ways, they're getting rid of us, um, refusing care, refusing to, you know, or dropping us as patients in, in not nice ways, thinking that this is not their job. They don't know what to do. They don't know where to turn. They don't know, they don't know who to turn to for help. Um, there's, uh, <laughs> this is the, part of the insanity. Oh, first I wanted to say, I was at, at such high risk to be forced, drugged, to be forced into, uh, to be wrongly, wrongly forced into a psych unit because they thought I was going off my rocker. They thought this was mental illness. They, these doctors can't recognize, they don't know what acute medication withdrawal looks like. And uh, I was at high risk to, you know, be force medicated be, for them to think I'm cra I'm nuts and force drug me. Uh, to, and keeping in mind that during the whole time, the whole withdrawal of Zopaclone and uh, clonazepam, I was sleeping only. I, 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 I was prior to the withdrawal, I was only sleeping one or two hours a night only one hour a night only or two hours only a night per night for almost a year prior to withdrawal. In withdrawal, I was sleeping not at all, zero, or one hour a night or two hours a night. I was highly suicidal through the whole entire withdrawal and through the entire time of seeing these different doctors. And, and in fight or flight nonstop. I still am in fight or flight and um, being threatened. And I was at such high risk for medical harm, for being force medicated for, you know, for them to inject me with, you know, uh, a medication that's going to calm me down, right? Like a benzo or a major tranquilizer. And the thing is, I was already stopping breathing. My throat was closing with severe apnea. My diaphragm was stopping. I was stopping breathing during the daytime at times. My nervous system was shutting down. At nighttime, I was breathing four times a minute. Had anybody force medicated me, it would have taken my life. It, I would not have survived. My heart and lungs were in crisis and um, orthopnea, uh, uh, inability to breathe laying down or struggling to breathe laying down, um, my throat closing, my diaphragm stopping. I was in respiratory failure. I was in respiratory crisis. Uh, low oxygen, high carbon dioxide, and I was being threatened to to shut up, to stop asking for help because nobody knew what to do. No, no doctor knew how to help. They should have hospitalized me. No one would. One doctor promised me to hospitalize me and then, uh, threatened me, got rid of me. Um, so, I mean, I was at high risk to be killed, to be finished off because they couldn't understand what they were looking at or dealing with. And they couldn't understand what a, uh, a life-threatening situation it would have been had they medicated me. Um, so there's a, a, here's another insane part of it. There's one addiction doctor in this city. And I called there to make an appointment and um, I'm not an addict. But I thought he might have, you know, some serious information. Why is this happening to me? Why is my body medically in crisis? And what can we do? And can you help me through the taper? Can you help me get off? By now, by the time I got to see him, I was in acute Zopaclone withdrawal. 
I was already off the benzos, severely injured. Now I'm getting injured from the Zopiclone. Uh, I have dropped, uh, I dropped foot, uh, nervous, uh, neuropathy, pain in my hands and feet, uh, numbness, burning. I'm not sleeping. I'm suicidal. And, uh, so they tell me at his office, you can't, oh, I, I said, I, they asked if I was an addict or, or whatever. And I said, no. So they refused me care. They wouldn't let me see him unless I'm an addict. So a month or two goes by and I'm brainstorming and looking for help and trying to figure out why am I, why is this life threatening? Why is this withdrawal life threatening? And I called back that, I called that office back. They didn't have my name the first time around. And I said, here's the thing. Here's the insanity of this situation. An older lady having to lie and say that she's an addict just to gain access to this doctor who might have information for me. So I called back. They said, you can't see him unless you live in the inner, inner city core, core downtown, which is, you know, hardcore drug addicts, uh, homeless people, blah, blah, blah. So I ha I lied and I said I had to give them an, an address that I lived in the inner inner core. So I get an appointment. I'm sitting there with crack addicts. I'm sitting there with severe addicts and street people and ho people that live at the homeless shelter. Pretending I'm an addict to gain d access to a physician. And he sees me and he was wonderful and he was horrified. He was just, his mouth was hanging open. He couldn't understand what's happening to me. I don't know how these doctors are so unaware when there are so many of us out here in, in medical crisis. He was incredibly empathetic and horrified and he could not understand. He said he's never seen anything like this. And he's dealing with heroin addicts and crack addicts and uh, people dying of alcoholism, you know. Um, he wished me luck. He gave me his condolences. He was sorry that this is happening to me. It's insane that addiction doctors don't even... this. They don't even know what they're looking at. They're, they've never seen this. Like acute chemical dependency, no addiction, no addiction, no craving, no wanting more, no, I don't want drugs. I want you to get me off of this drug. We have, imagine an older lady having to lie and say she's an addict to get, a, to gain access to a doctor. I've known people in a acute withdrawal like this, middle-aged women and older women, their doc I'll make another video. Their doctors won't won't give them a taper. They won't help them taper off.